In a long protracted war, one must remember something. Taking land is the easy part. Holding it, now that is much, much more sporting. Humans, though very strong compared to the rest, in far as weaponry and even their brute strength, do not have the numbers at this point to spread out amongst the stars and take all three factions down in a matter of weeks or months. Because of this, they need to come up with solutions. One of the solutions is to take the captured ships from the surrendered forces, or those that they can refit and rearm, get them ready to fight, and this way, they be able to leave the aliens their own homeworld and their own protective fleets. They would upgrade the weapons, the sensors, definitely the engines, to make sure they are above standard with their faction counterparts. However, they would not ever give them any type of jump drive technology. No, no, no. That is a human invention. Only humans are allowed to have it. Only humans could know that this is a way to jump past the lines and hit further targets if need be. And now that the aliens can protect their own worlds, humans only have to leave behind a token force. The token force is normally one battleship, two cruisers, four destroyers, eight frigates, and about 32 corvettes. The corvettes and frigates are only left behind because they're used to shuttle personnel and equipment back and forth to the surface. Anything larger than a frigate and you get caught up in the gravity well and, well, you better eject because you're going down, boy. The other ships, from the destroyers on up, are simply security. They're there to give the other forces just some extra firepower, just in case. The number of human fleets has grown as many of the other colonies and homeworlds start to bring their own ships to bear. At this point, there are three full invasion fleets able to reach out into the stars and take entire planets. Behind them, there's two full hospital fleets, most of which are made up of medical ships, most of which look very strange even by human standards, but are angels to those who are wounded on the battlefield. Along with that, there's also two recovery fleets. These are full of engineers and equipments, anything able to rebuild the infrastructure so that the planet's own population could finally recover. And to everyone's surprise, there's another fleet. No, not just one. There's four civilian assist groups out there. These are personnel who own their own ships, most of which aren't armed beyond point defense systems. Yet, they still bring their own ships to bear. They bring their ships to shuttle in any type of equipment that's needed, any wounded out, and also, they pack them with all sorts of food. This is needed, as more often than not, if the fleet above the surface doesn't surrender against the humans, neither does the surface. And this suits the humans just fine. They like getting a little up close and personal. The battle plan when entering a sector is considered pretty much standard, yet there's always X factors to look into. This would be something as simple as classifications of each planet. Are they aggro worlds? Are they paradise worlds? Are they dust bowls? Are they ice balls? Are they whatever they might be? This also has to do with how many are able to be colonized? How many are colonized? How many can be terraformed? How many gas giants, which is very important as you don't want to get too close to those. They'll pull one of your battleships right down into them and squish them like a beer can. Is there also maybe an asteroid belt? Hell, even a minefield. What type of star? Is it binary? Is it what type of population is there? Is there a slave population, which normally there is? And is the population that's holding them more friendly? Is they willing to possibly surrender? And, of course, dealing with those that are being liberated from bondage. There's a certain factor that interested and angered humans to absolutely no end. As it turns out, just looking at a cursory evaluation of their genetics, interbreeding of the different species is nearly impossible. In fact, there's only one or two particular species that can produce children all the way to term. Can they possibly impregnate a female? Sure. Will that child make it? No, usually not. 
Due to this, there's no protection from disease either. If they are caught having any type of disease, even something as common as the cold, they would be simply disposed of. Yet those that own the slaves don't care. They prefer the skin to scale to carapace to fur to whatever in the hell type of contact it might be. All species have medical tech that, of course, kills viruses, but there's always one that sneaks through. But they can kill most outbreaks before they become any type of problem. Because of this, most of the population of females, when they want to be plussed up, are sent to a stud or one is brought in. Most of the males are not used for this purpose, only the most attractive ones, not always the strongest. As it turns out, with slaves, just like their ships, the factions care more about aesthetics than practicality. However, there is one area where they are very practical, as they did not want a full explosion of slaves. It turns out that those not used for studying are commonly castrated, very commonly. And this is done normally with zero anesthetic, just some sort of machines to strap them down and then movement with the blade. This is usually very, very dangerous and very deadly if you're not done right. This is why in cities, mainly, it is very common to find that slaves are only female, as most of the males are sent off into work. Human medical tech is able to rebuild their lost pieces, but there's a bit of an issue. Though they can grow everything back, contraception with artificially grown parts is difficult at best. Human tech, of course, has its limits. News about this brings sympathy, and to many of those, it brings more anger. As the word that those other species are unable to be impregnated by humans, or impregnate humans, whichever way you want to spin that one, this brought many laws into effect. As no one was to take advantage of those that were former slaves, many of them, their minds were so broken, they would simply give themselves over if given the order. This created a situation, though rare, aliens got to see exactly how humans deal with this type of perpetrator, or any for that matter. They didn't understand when humans kept using the word whippin'. He's getting a whippin'. A whippin' is not an easy thing. A whippin' is not a simple thing. They didn't understand because they didn't know what a whippin' was. Well, they're going to find out what a whoopin' is pretty damn soon. In public square, one of the humans was brought out, no shirt, just trousers. His hands were laced up and then pulled apart, making sure he was standing up. The charges of what he had done, which he had done against one of the former slaves, were read out. The verdict, of course, was given. Guilty, and how many lashes they were getting. The aliens were surprised. They didn't know what this was. They were confused and looking at each other. They were more and more interested to see how this was going to work. That was until they heard the crack. Many of them winced as they heard the first time a human wince in pain and blood flow from the wounds down his back. Many couldn't understand how he could even absorb this much impact. Each of these cracks would be enough to kill one of them, just one of these hits. And he was taking hit after hit from two different personnel holding these long pieces of treated hide. It was insane. As they kept going, reaching the end, the humans screamed out in pain. This caused many of the onlookers to immediately disperse as they didn't want to see it anymore. Once lashings are done, they could see that the human was left hanging by his wrist for at least 24 hours hung longer depending on the crime. They did not receive any medical treatment until said time expires, and this is how aliens realized a simple truth. You have to hold yourself accountable before you can hold others accountable. They didn't quite understand, as most of them had lived their life in bondage and saw that their slave masters had taken advantage of everything and never been held to account, but now... Now they deal with humans. Humans have gone beyond this. Once they reached out to space, they realized that corporal punishment was the only option they had left. This was the only way to make sure they maintained order. 
and it works. Over time, many of the alien races that allied with the humans adopted this, though they didn't use the same type of technique. They had something similar, but they could see, at least if humans were brought up on charges, they would have to get another human to actually administrate the punishment. They couldn't do it. To the humans, it was... What did the word they use? They said they're ticklish as they gave some sort of strange sound. With this as a base, training the allies on their upgraded new ships became a bulwark of discipline. Cross-training meant efficiency went up extremely high. Those that had worked on ships before thought they'd be placed at a station and this is all they would ever do. Oh, hell no. They would find out the real quick way that they need to know as much as possible so they could take over for anyone else. As they began to learn from this training, they realized how humans were so efficient. And as they kept training, they realized they could have pride. Pride in their abilities, pride in their crew, pride in their ship. And because of this, they became a very well-oiled machine. The aliens that were going to help out the humans were attached to the first fleet. The number of allied ships outside human was one battleship, five cruisers, 18 destroyers, 29 frigates, and nine corvettes. Captured corvettes used for planetary trade and other systems primarily. Even though they were the main focus of what was captured, only nine of them ended up on the assault fleet's radar. As they practiced inside an asteroid field, they realized that the ships that they were flying in were far more capable than anything they had been in before. If they were to go head-to-head -head with a ship of a similar class of the faction side, it would be no, no single thought about who would come out on top. It's possible they could even face two to one, three to one they would end up outgunned. Yet they still took pride in the fact that they were flying much, much better ships. Yet one lingering thought still remained. That they were still less capable than their human equivalents. Human classes are just bigger. They look at a human destroyer and it's almost three times the size of theirs. They were easy to figure this out as humans were very tall, especially in their suits, and they needed to move around. Though there was human concept that they had a lot of trouble wrapping all their brains around. That was damage control. In faction culture, everything is disposable. Your ship gets a hole in it, you simply turn it in and get a new one. And that ship was simply destroyed, discarded, or what have you. Stripped down for nothing. The human ships, however, seemed to get holes punched in them all the times, and they simply plugged the hole. This was an odd realization when they found out that the human ships were not actually organic or self-sealing in any way. Though they did have some systems that would seal up a small crack or a small hole, if one of the shots actually was able to get through, then a team would actually have to go up there and seal it themselves. This let them realize just how absolutely insane humans are to go into a decompressurized area and seal up a hole in the middle of a firefight. To them, this is insanity. The assault fleets expand very slowly, very methodically, moving as though they're programmed to do. But they don't move very quickly from solar system to solar system, sector to sector. No, they do not want to overextend themselves and they don't want to caught, as the humans say, with pants down. Many of the allies look at this as they go, well, we don't wear pants, so how's that work? Nobody had to worry about this. However, the humans needed time as they expanded. They needed time. That's why they moved so slow. They needed time to build more ships, to restock weapons, to cycle in new blood and train them. And even as the logistics flowed, they came up with even new problems. Whenever they jumped in the system, did they more or less planets? This would put more of a strain on the personnel as you would stretch your forces even further. Were there additional colonies or stations? They, of course, had to watch out for the non-existent mines. As it turns out, most species don't even consider mines an option, which suits the humans just fine. But they're still going to watch their step. 
The initial invasion of the Cola system went off without any hitch. The Third Fleet had blinked in and expected limited resistance. What they found was ships seemingly trying to warp out of the system. They couldn't figure out what was going on. Were they just running away? What's going on? Immediately, they tried to hail them and order them to stand down if they don't want to be harmed. The enemy, still running away, attempted to fire well out of effective range. Most ships just had to fire their stabilizing boosters and they just got out of the way. Most of those shots seemed to just fly off into the ether. Of course, before that, you would hear General Quarters, brace for evasive maneuvers. I say again, brace for evasive maneuvers. Ballistics missed by a long shot and they take forever to get there as they were fired several minutes away. Battleships decided to move into position and took precision shots at the retreating warships. Unlike the factions, these warships were taking precision shots. They tried to disable, if possible. They did this until the ships got within the safety of the planet. The battleships were ordered not to fire on the planet itself as it was still home to a lot of personnel. Though as they approached they realized that the enemy was not facing out. They were facing towards the planet. Not only that, every once in a while you would see them fire towards the surface. The comms had to hack into everything to figure out what in the hell was going on, and they found out really quick. Apparently, there was a rebellion happening on the planet. The Admiral relayed this to the captains, and before he could say anything, one of his ensigns actually said out loud, Well... We didn't come here to sit with our thumbs up our asses, sir. Though everybody on the bridge turned towards the young man and thought, you are going to be facing a captain's mask, you moron. It was enough to get everybody to realize exactly what they had to do. The fleet immediately began to advance. The hospital ships were told to hold position along with the civilian and recovery ships. The fleet would hail the factions again. New faction ships began to notice the humans approaching. However, they didn't turn their weapons towards the humans until they were within human secondary range. This meant that they were within turrets. The turrets might not be as strong as the main keel-mounted weapons, but they could maneuver a whole lot faster and fire a hell of a lot more often. Faction ships immediately began to turn their weapons when they realized they were stuck between a quite literal floating rock and a hard race. And in that moment when they realized they had to take out the human, all the weapons turned. And for a moment, that place in space was Armageddon and there was a firefight! Humans with their mechanical precision and the factions with their desperation and tenacity, of course, not wanting to get blasted point-blank range from the humans. The ships eventually got so close that the tertiary weapons and point defense guns actually got into the fight. The faction battleships, all three of them, tried to bring their main guns around as their ships began to maneuver. At least, they tried to. Every single captain realized this was what they were trying to do and we're not going to let them do that. The battleships were cut down where they stood. The faction cruisers, numbering eight, turned much faster and were able to fire into the human lines. Humans retaliated by blowing the cruisers to pieces. While in this mayhem, there was a whole bunch of drones whipping around the battlefield, corvettes ducking and dodging, making sure that they were not caught into the big weapons that were being fired. It was like a flying circus and nobody could see what was going on. They had to trust their sensors the entire time and hope they didn't fire on their own people, because friendly fire isn't so friendly. However, there was one bonus. There was no Titan-class ship here. This meant they wouldn't have to worry about knocking a ship out of orbit and crashing it into the planet. They've already risked that far too many times, and they were told not to do that. Once the battle was over, the humans hailed the government command. The response was not kind, as they claimed, We will destroy this planet if you even attempt to take it. Go ahead and try. We all knew what this was. Asset denial. Everybody knows that. It's a standard military tactic. But no one 
has enough to simply blow up the entire planet. One of the destroyer captains put it simple. Yeah, he must be losing bad down there. With that, the orbital drop was prepped and ready in an impeccable amount of time, though the hard part was trying to get the updated IFF identify friend and foe tags to everybody before the drop even happened. The lines of friend and enemy were extremely blurred and were constantly changing. This was going to be difficult to say the least. As the pods crashed down after everything they had to go through, everybody exited the pods and all those on the ground were still in shock. The pods came down and simply knocked everything sideways. What the hell was this? It wasn't a bomb. It didn't explode. What the hell? Then all of a sudden, the sides burst open and bipeds found in battle armor walked out. Not only that, they raised weapons that seemed gargantuan to most. How were they able to lift something so heavy? Everybody was in so much shock that they didn't know whether to run, shoot, or shit themselves. But that is when the bipeds that they saw began to target and fire on who they believed was the enemy. The problem is, the friendlies couldn't figure out what was going on. Who the hell were these guys? Though they realized real quick as these bipeds were moving towards the capital. Along with that, their frigates and corvettes had landed, dropping a whole bunch of armor off. This was insane. What, was, what were these guys? But apparently, they're here to help. Though the drop went by the numbers, there was an issue. The fact that there was two separate capitals on this planet. There were two main continents, and because of that, there were two separate capitals. In fact, there were two different sentient species on this planet, at least locals. And this made things very, very interesting, since both of them were a semi-subterranean species, which made clearing out tunnels very, very difficult, though not impossible. The locals thought for sure they were dead when the humans advanced, and they were stuck between whatever these bipeds were and their own oppressors they were fighting. They thought for sure they were going to be caught in a crossfire, but no, these bipeds simply ran up, jumped over top of them, and continued to advance. Not saying a word, not waving hello, not any type of greeting, but just raising up some sort of kinetic weapon and leaving a trail of thunder behind them as they went. When the locals realized they weren't about to get stomped into the ground, they watched and were at awe at these bipedal forces as they moved with unbelievable efficiency. Something so big, something so bulky, something so mechanical. Wait a minute, are these organic? What the hell was this? And because they moved so well, the capital was taken in less than an hour, the second capital in under two hours and even the heavy weapons had barely reached the surface by the time the capitals were taken and the governors were taken down. For one of them, there was a show of liberation and not domination, as the planetary governor was personally brought out with their own slaves. The slave collars were then ripped off by the bipeds that they saw, and the officials were kicked down the stairway. The robots that watched didn't talk, but the PA system spit out to let everyone know that humanity was here, and humanity was going to protect them. While the bodies of the officials were still dripping blood from the local justice that was brought down on them, the medical and recovery ships began to land. Military packs up its large weapons and was beginning to lead. The captured conscripts, i.e. slaves, were released and asked if they wanted to go home. That is, if their planet had been one of the ones that had been liberated. If so, they loaded up so they could get up and leave. The world's infrastructure, due to not only the invasion, but also the rebellion that was happening when the humanists arrived, had torn most of the infrastructure to pieces. This would mean recovery is going to take a while, and the third fleet wasn't going to be able to move on anytime soon. At this point, the war had stretched on for several years, and humanity was getting weary. War weary, that is. That is, until a fresh set of images came from the front. 
from the Third Fleet. There was a bunch of kids, former slaves, not on their own planet, running up and hugging the legs of these armored machines. The armored machines just seemed to stop and look down. The young ones were all of different species from freed worlds. At that point, they kept crying out, wanting to go home, because they just wanted to go home. They didn't have anyone there. They had been dragged there, and they wanted to leave the nightmare behind. The metal bipeds all seemed to stop, and others showed up as well. They reached down, and each of them carried at least two of these children, if they didn't climb onto the metal backs of these bipeds. And they went over where they could get food and medical supplies. The next set of images is on a planet that had been liberated. The images showed one of the corvettes coming down silently using its repulsor engines to slowly land. The video showed the ground crew making sure people stayed back. And as the ramp opened, the sound of boots against the bulkheads could be heard. Then, as they came down the ramp, the sound changed slightly. They could then hear screams coming from the crowd as the image of these armored bipeds walking out with young ones in their arms. The screams from the crowd as others ran forward, kids then turning their heads towards the screams, and then they started screaming and started wiggling, trying to reach out, trying to get down. They were easily, slowly put down on the ground, and the kids immediately bolted towards those that were running up. Though no one in humanity could understand what the words were being said, as it was well beyond their own comprehension, the translation came down to simply daddy, or sister, mommy, things of that nature. While this was going on in the background, they could see the armor simply stop, look at them, and then turn around, almost all simultaneously, and simply walk up the ramp. They didn't even wait for the armor to get inside before the ramp began to close and the corvette began to lift off. Because of this, around the fleet, motivation was raised up higher. A phrase began to be uttered around the fleet to make sure they knew what they were fighting for. They now had a reason to fight. They knew what they had to do. And before each drop, you would hear it. You would hear it from the crew getting ready. You would hear it from those getting ready to drop. Coined by one of the greatest heroes in all of human history. You would hear them say, One more. Please, Lord, help me get one more. <laughs>